<laughs> Welcome to the One Day Unication Workshop. Um, this is for self-help toolkit uh, for clients, students, practitioners, and friends. Um, unication is a new word in the English language. It means communication that creates unity with yourself and others and divine spirit nature. So it is body, mind, spirit integration. Um, we're going to start with um, you filling out those sheets in front of you, in case you haven't already. And what you need to do with that sheet, have you got one? So what you need to do with that sheet is just put your first name on it and just do the first three, Mark. First three. And yeah, the, the purpose of writing these first three things of what would I like to create or change or accomplish in my life right now, this is not set in stone. It just puts marks on a blank wall. And we, once you have that, I'm going to take you through um, helping clarify that so that it's not too general. Because when things are too general, they're hard to track. Um, so we're gonna, just going to start one at a time and um, what I want to say to you is now that you've written those things down, now you can take a moment out and to actually let's hear what they are first. So what's your first three? S say that again. Connection and relationships, personal freedom and resource to create $10,000 marks. Perfect. And your first three? Uh, expansion of my capacity. Can you speak just a little louder? Expansion of my capacity to love. Oh, yes. Exception of situations in life that we're threatening. Uh, breathing consciously on a daily basis. Great. And your first three? Um, to let go of past pain and feel more joy and connection in my life. Um, to connect and make a difference to other people's lives. Um, to create and serve and get to the point where I feel good enough to turn this into a reality. And I'd like to attract a healthy, joyful, loving and supportive relationship. Great. And your? So, go ahead and, like I said, it's not set in stone. But you won't be able to proceed with us to the next step until you just pop three of them down. So remember, it's just, it's just a starting point. So three things you want to create, change, or accomplish in your life, Mark, right now, this moment. Finish my projects that I have to finish. Perfect. Yes. And buy a musical instrument. Okay, awesome. So, um, because I do online coaching inquiry um, with people around the planet, uh, starting with this same question, um, it's my experience that often people's goals. I can sort of understand all the things that you said, generally speaking. So the thing is, I, I, I'm hoping that by the time we're finished today, that you will have your goals trackable. 
like, so that if I said to you, two weeks from now, or two months from now, or two years from now, how's number one going? I would like you to be able to say, um, it's great, it's done, or I'm three quarters of the way through, or I'm halfway there, or I just started, or I'm stuck. So right now, with those three things that you said, this is called personal data. This is not contemplating, it's not a lot of writing, it's just a few squiggles. <laughs> and no one can do this for you. So these five questions, I want you to just ask yourself for each of those goals. The first one is, if you accomplished number one or number two or number three, what would it look like to you if you accomplished it? Just a few squiggles. <laughs> go ahead, get your pen going. And again, with just, just a couple of squiggles. Um, the next one is, what would it sound like to you if you accomplished those three goals? And you can do them one at a time. The most important question that, that has the most weight to helping you track your goals, which you can, when, if you can allow yourself to go here, this is one of the most important things to ask yourself. What would it feel like to you if you accomplished number one, number two, number three. So we've had a lot of research about when you visualize things, it helps to make them happen faster. And there's these old studies about basketball players who went to the gym and then basketball players who visualized themselves going to the gym and sinking baskets. And how that the people that visualized them actually often did better than the people who went to the gym. But we've come a long way since then. And what we've arrived at now is if you can ever, with some goal that you want to accomplish, <coughs> Just go into inside and ask yourself, if I accomplish this goal, what would it feel like to me? And go there, go to that feeling. And what the research shows is if you can just go there for one or two minutes, so it means closing your eyes, thinking if I accomplished this goal, what would I feel like? If you can go to the feeling, then you will be having that goal manifesting faster than a freight train, just with the feeling. The fourth one is really significant to ask about those three goals. What would tell you that you'd accomplished one, two, or three? Just a few squiggles. What would tell you that you accomplished this? Squiggle, squiggle. And this is probably the biggest level or question that you can get the personal data for is what would tell others that I'd accomplished this goal? So 
So I'm going to practice one of the most important tools that if you were to only get this tool down from this whole workshop, it will change your life. <laughs> so I'm going to practice it myself because I'm feeling, um, yeah, a bunch of things about the workshop being a little late, about it raining, about uh, just a bunch of things that I was feeling really centered, clear, and uh, confident. And then I started having these feelings of, wow, what if nobody shows up, or what if uh, the sound equipment doesn't work, or all these things that, what ifs. So, what I'm going to just introduce to you right now, and we're going to keep going back to throughout the whole workshop, is the Unication Prescription. And it is the fastest way that me working with body, mind, spirit integration for over 30 years, it's the fastest way I have found to get myself and others when you're feeling less than perfect, when you're feeling a little stressed, and when you're feeling really messed up. This is the reset button. And you can use this anytime, anywhere. It takes less than a minute. So nobody can ever tell me, I don't have a minute, Lux. <laughs> so for me right now, what that means is, I am going to just take my attention out of my left brain. Yeah, the part that's going blah, 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 blah. <laughs> so I'm taking the focus out of the left brain and I'm putting the focus in my heart center. So if you take your hands up right now, you put them on your heart center, all of you, and you take, take seven breaths in a row in the heart center and just notice how it feels in there. You're only efforting on the inhale and on the exhale you're just letting go. The image is a glass of water turned upside down. <sighs> and if you make sound on the exhale, it even lets go faster. Because only efforting on the inhale, ah, letting go on the exhale, the image is a glass of water turned upside down, it just falls out. If you add the sound, that is the fastest way to release tension. So whether you're giving birth, whether you're being robbed, <laughs> whether you're having a heart attack, when you go out of the thinking and put your attention into the heart center, the feeling being, in there, in this heart center, that's where you are not connected to the left brain. So what is in the left brain? What's in the left brain is the thinking, thinking over time. <laughs> and what's in there the past is in the left brain. And you may consider that the past has already happened. You can't change it. But you can change what you think about it, which may help. What's also in the left brain is the future. What ifs? The future hasn't even happened yet. So it prompted the Buddha to say, the only thing that we all can really be sure of is everything you have will soon be gone. You can count on that. He didn't say that to make you feel bad. He said that to show you the value of when you get in the now, when you get in the moment. 
So this unication prescription, like I said, is the fastest way to get into the now. It takes less than seven breaths. So when I keep my breathing connected, rising, falling, it feels warm in there, it feels soft. Why am I getting you to just breathe up there? Why not the belly? Why not the diaphragm? So this goes for all of us. Your higher self is this center here, one, this center here, two, this center here, three. Those three centers, higher self. Just below the navel, one, a little farther down, two, tip of the coccyx, three, is the lower self. So there's your, our lower self. There's my higher self. So I want to ask you each individually, uh, what do you think, let's start with you, what do you think connects your higher self to your lower self? Your breathing. Your breathing, thank you. What do you think connects your higher self to your lower self? The heart. The heart, thank you. Intention. Intention. Energy. 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 Okay. So what I'm going to say to you is, I hope you remember, and we'll keep going back to it, is actually this center, the fourth center, is in between the upper three and the lower three. Yeah, the heart center. When it's open, rising, falling, warm and soft, you feel grounded, you feel connected, you feel whole. Whenever this gets shut down, so if you see me suddenly going like this, you can see I might have a little bit of breath in my belly, but you can see I have no idea what my foot's doing. I don't hear anything out there. Why? Because I'm in here, in the blah, 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 the left brain. So when you breathe into that upper chest, you may find, wow, it feels a little restricted up there. It feels a little tight. It's a little hard to get the breath up there. So. I would like you to just get in your mind, how would you like your upper chest to feel? Would you like it to feel like this? Or would you like it to feel warm, soft, rising and falling? If you were with another being and your chest was against theirs, how would you like their chest to feel? Warm, soft, rising and falling? Or like this. <laughs> it's kind of a no-brainer. So how do we get this upper chest soft, warm, rising? And I'm suggesting to you, yeah, all day long with every breath. I'm going to tell you the two most powerful tools that we all have to change ourselves with don't cost anything. They're your thoughts and your breath. If you are just paying attention to them, you'll be a quantum leap ahead of the average bear these days. There's an epidemic of inability to stay focused for long, longer than three minutes. And that's what being on the phone and having this blah, blah, blah does is it's distracting. So whenever you feel like you're getting distracted or you're less than perfect, you can take a minute out. And people don't even know what you're doing. You just, 
I put my attention in here. I get into the feeling being. I take seven breaths. And at the end of the seventh breath, I go back to, okay, what am I doing here? What am I thinking? So what I'm saying to you is, to stop this blah, 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 you only need to interrupt it. The problem is when it starts, when you wake up and it doesn't finish <laughs> till you have your first drink in the afternoon or you have a smoke or you, <laughs> you know, then it might subside. So I'm saying to you, you always have the ability, it's called free will, to pick your next thought. If you don't exercise your ability to pick your next thought, you're going to get a thought anyway. It's going to come from where? So one of the biggest messages we're going to cover in this workshop is, so what is that about um, where these thoughts come from? Where do the thoughts come from? I'm saying to you, if you want to, you can pick your next thought at any time. It's called free will. So no matter what I'm experiencing right now, if I want to pick the next thought, I can. If I don't exercise that and pick the next thought, one's going to come in anyway. And where is it going to come from? It's going to come from what's called the unconscious or the subconscious. So the left brain, where the blah, blah, blah is, yeah, um, that's not the conscious. That's not where you pick things. Those things are coming in automatically. And what, what is the difference between the conscious mind and the subconscious mind. So I'm going to give, by the way, all these things I'm going to be sharing with you, they're not the world according to Lux. These are just considerations for you to check out. And later you can give me feedback about these considerations, whether they helped or didn't. So I was very surprised to learn that synonyms for conscious mind, unconscious mind. What's a synonym for those two words? The synonym for the conscious mind is soul. The synonym for the unconscious mind is spirit. That's interesting. So, your conscious mind has the ability to originate an idea and execute it. So you can think about doing something and you can make it happen. The unconscious mind or subconscious mind only executes. It has no ability to originate. So how hypnotism works is if you surrender your ability to originate a thought and a hypnotist comes up with a thought to put into your unconscious mind. He originates it. And if he gets it into your unconscious mind, it happens. Auto-suggestion is you picking that and putting it into your subconscious mind. And it happens. The thing that I want to make most clear to you is we don't need to try and define what's the difference between conscious and unconscious or conscious and unconscious. But I want you to consider that if anything is unconscious in any of us here or anyone you know, 
if it's unconscious in them, the basic meaning is they can't see it anymore. So if we're, you're, you're interacting with someone and, yeah, if they are in the unconscious having thoughts, they can't see that. Their mom, their partner, their dog may see it. But if it's unconscious in them, they can't see it. So what I want you guys to consider is if, and I guarantee this to you, my children, my clients, myself, and anyone who's listening, is if you can't see something, it's really hard to change it. So the first step in freedom choice change is identifying what programs do I have in my operating system? So what that means is if we look at a phone from the outside, if we look at a computer from the outside, or we look at a person from the outside, you have no idea what's in the operating system from the outside. Now if you know how to get in the control panel in your computer or phone, you can see every program that's in the operating system. And I want you to consider that these programs that are in the operating system of your computer, for example, they are producing results 24 hours a day, whether you're asleep or awake. They're in the operating system. If you can't get in there, they're just running you. And you don't even know it. You don't even see it. <laughs> so what I'm saying to you is, how do you get to see what's in your operating system? Because those programs that are in your operating system, they started when you were born. They started at birth. And I'm going to ask you to think about that actually anything that you have experienced since you were born until this present moment, anything that you made not okay about yourself or about others or about the way the world works or anything that anyone helped you make not okay about yourself, others and the way the world worked, like your parents, from when you were born until now, Anything that you made really not okay, the moment that you made it not okay was when you started carrying it with you, literally, on your shoulders, in your being. So I'm saying whenever we make something really not okay, we're carrying it. And what I'm going to suggest to you to think about is most people have had these programs go in since they were born most of the programs, a lot of them are already laid down by the time you're 10, 11, 16. They're just all laid down. And unless you have an amazing ayahuasca trip, a near-death experience, an awesome workshop, an amazing body work session uh, that causes you to rethink what these programs that I have in my operating system, if I could see them, do I really like them? So programs like I'm not good enough, or I don't deserve love, or I never have a good time at parties, I, what I'm saying to you is, that when you have that program, I never have a good time at parties. If you go to a party and you start having a good time, you're going to mess things up. Because you have a program that says you never have a good time at parties. So 
you're going to knock the punch bowl over, you're, you're going to throw up, you're going to, something is going to change that because you never have a good time at parties. So at the end of this workshop, if we go to a party and I'm walking up the stairs thinking, wow, that was an amazing day. I'm so ready to have a good time. And I'm thinking that thought as I'm walking up the stairs. Now, if you're walking up the stairs with me and you're thinking, oh, the last time I was at a party, I met a loser. It was just, he stole my wallet. I hope that doesn't happen again. Okay, so this is how our thoughts work. It's, it's covered in what they call the law of attraction. The problem is in the law of attraction, the most people learned the coffee table version, the movie, they didn't quite get across that the law of attraction is always working. Always working for both things wanted and unwanted. So whenever you focus on what isn't okay, what you're afraid of, what you don't want to have happen, you're going to get more of it. That's the law. That's the way karma works. That's the way physics works. That's the way a garden works. Whatever seeds you plant, you reap. So if you plant fear, sadness, not okayness, you get more of it. The good news is, if you are walking up those stairs and you're thinking, I'm ready to have a good time, then you are planting openness, you're planting, you know, you're ready to have a good time if it's, if it's possible. But for that person who's having the thought, I sure hope nothing bad happens here, um, it, they're going to manifest it. So if we walk inside the party and there's 20 people there, and 18 people are amazing beings and two people are real losers, not okay, the question is, who am I going to attract with I'm so ready to have a good time? And who is my friend who's saying, I sure hope nothing bad happens here. Who are they going to attract? They're going to attract those two people. And you know what's really bizarre about it? Is once they do, and we are leaving the party, and I had a great time, and they had a bad time, as we're walking down the stairs, they're going to, they're going to say to me, you see, Lux, I told you, I always have a bad time at parties. It's crazy. So, yeah, how do you find these programs out that are in the 90% of you that's called the subconscious, the unconscious, that normally are off limits? How, how do you get to them? So what we're going to share today is how, we, how you do get there, how we do that. And the foundation for that is the prescription. So whenever you're feeling not okay, not feeling relaxed, come out of the thinking. Get into the feeling being. You can always take the focus out of here and put it into here. Yeah, you don't even have to try to stop this blah, blah, blah. Because actually, that blah, blah, blah is called your ego. So one of my teachers said, trying to get the ego to stop is like asking a narcissist to put out a fire. The ego is completely unwilling. Completely unwilling. It's not going to agree to give up. I'm going to have you consider this too, is that when you choose out of the ego and go into the heart center, where does fear live? Where do you think fear comes from? In your head. 
That's right. Fear comes from ego. No ego, no fear. When you go into the heart center, what I want you to think about is in here, there's no past in here. There's no future in here. There's no judgments. There's no beliefs. There's no story in here. And I hope it's going to start to dawn in you that actually, as soon as you get into here, it's the only place where everything is possible in here. If you're up here, where the past, the future, <laughs> the beliefs, hardly anything is possible up there. So when you get into the moment, when you get into the now, that's when everything is possible. Who else is in the now? Plants are in the now. They're not thinking about what happened five years ago. And they don't care who's going to win the elections. Animals are in the now. And people are in the now when they're experiencing uh, a flow moment. Yeah. When people are experiencing a flow moment, they're in the now. So what is a flow moment? You can experience a flow moment if you're making love with someone and instead of thinking, am I doing this right? Is she okay? Am I okay? Blah, blah, blah. Yeah, that's no fun at all. But as soon as you lose the sense of other, as soon as you feel that you, you lose the sense of separateness, it just feels like all of a sudden it's flowing. You can get that making love. You can get that surfing. You can get that jamming. If I'm trying to play music and I'm thinking, am I okay? Is he okay? Am I making the right notes? Yeah, that's not it. But when I get to a place where I'm in the now, I almost feel when I'm like I'm jamming, the music is just coming through me. It's just flowing. When the person's on that wave, they're not thinking, should I go right? Should I go left? No, they're, they're in the flow. So I'm going to say that whenever you're in the flow, like if you're creating something and you're in the flow, you feel like the creativity, it just takes you. You just, you lose sense of time. <laughs> it's just, you're in the now, you're in the flow. So how do we stay in the flow? And we're going to come back again to what I said to you. You want to stay in the flow? Use the prescription. Because the prescription always puts you back in the flow. So when I go into the heart center, there are no boundaries in here. This is where everybody feels connected. There's no borders in here. There's no past. There's no future. There's just this moment, this eternal moment in the now. So sometimes I have people say, well, so you're saying that it's good to stay in the now? I'm like, well, it's a choice. Would you like to get in the now right now? Or would you like to go back to my parents weren't there for me? My marriage broke up. I have no money. <laughs> or do you want to get in the now where everything's possible in this moment? Whenever we get into the now and get into flow, that's where everything's possible. So I want you to consider, can you control that? You can pick it, but you can't really control it. Can you explain it? 
not really, but you don't need to, to feel it. You don't need to control or understand or explain the now. You can feel it though, when you're there. So I'm going to get you to consider that spirit is all of the information. It's all the thoughts that were ever thought, all the thoughts that will be thought. Spirit is the energy that created all the universes, the ones you know about and the ones you don't know about. Spirit is all the information. You could never understand it. You could never explain it all. You could never control it. So, but you can feel it. Yeah. So does anyone have any questions about where, where we got to so far? Really? No questions. Was that recording? <laughs> good. We're good to go. Um, unintegrated traumas. <laughs> That's what keeps us from being in the now. So an unintegrated trauma is anything that's ever happened to you in the past that was physical, like you were born with the cord around your neck, you were abused, your parents split up when you're five. Those are traumas. The problem when we have traumas when we're younger is we don't have the ability to be objective about them. We don't understand, hey, if uh, my dad beat me up, it wasn't my fault. So what happens when you're younger and, th and traumas happen, the thoughts you have, if your parents split up, is you have thoughts like, you look around, you see some of your friends have a father, you don't, you think, when you're small and young, you think, uh, I guess I don't deserve a father. I guess I'm not good enough. And that's a program that goes into the operating system. So you, you, you find yourself being 20 years old and you're not at your parents' place anymore and you're thinking, you know, I'm free, I can do what I want to do. And then you find these things happening to you. And you can't really explain why is this happening? Why am I, why do I keep attracting relationships that don't last very long? Well, one of the first things that you can look at is look at what happened with your parents. If your parents were happy, your parents are still together now, then it's a lot more likely that you're going to attract relationships that stay together and are happy. Because that's the foundation you had. So when I see the Me, Me Too movement and see the people saying that, you know, we all need to look at how patriarchy needs to go and we need to respect women. I, I get it. I, I'm, I'm there. I I'm support that. But the thing is, the way that you create that and change that isn't something that someone does outside of you. So what I want you to consider is this is the most important question in this workshop. Who do you think is responsible for your feelings? Who's responsible for your feelings, Mark? 
And who is responsible for your feelings? Yeah. So, do you notice that people around you from time to time try to make you feel like you're responsible for those feelings? How could you do this to me after all I've done for you? Um, right? And it's like all of a sudden, uh oh, what codependency means is looking for completion outside of yourself. What blame, blaming, whether you blame yourself or whether you blame others, it gets in the way. It's how you give up your power. As soon as you blame someone, saying it's not your fault, it's their fault, then you, you can't change that. They have to change that. So when I was trying to get a sense, a handle on all these things, um, thinking, oh, I, you know, if I just find my right partner, my soulmate, <laughs> uh, everything will be better. And I had a teacher who said, yeah, you know, people think that if you find what will complete you, then you will be whole. So it's like you're half a person and you find your other half and it equals a whole. And what he said is they don't realize it's, it's not an addition, it's a multiplication. It's not a half plus a half equals a whole. It's a half times a half. So it equals a quarter. So if you're by yourself and you're happy half the time and half the time you're not, if you're in a codependent relationship, then the half the time that you're starting to feel happy and your partner isn't, if you're in a codependent relationship, now you're not happy then either. Because the happiness doesn't come from outside. It comes from inside. And actually thinking that your father or a guru or a teacher or somebody outside you is going to tell you how it is. Make it better for you. I spent a lot of time looking for completion outside of myself. I took all these trainings, these meditations, these different paths, and uh, I felt like they were valuable. And I was blessed to have many, many teachers. And then one day I had a teacher that helped me see that me looking for completion outside of myself with a teacher was never going to happen. That the only place the completion was going to come from is when I stopped looking outside for completion, went inside where I'm in control, and got completion inside, got completion with myself in this moment. So what I'm going to say to you guys, if you look in the mirror, when you look in that mirror, if you can love what you're looking at 100%, accept everything that you're looking at. That's called unconditional love. That's unconditional love. You look in the mirror, you go, yeah, there's a few gray things there, there's a, but you know what, I, I love it anyway. I, I accept myself. I accept myself. And I'm going to suggest to you, if you wanted to give love to someone else, and you wanted to give trust to your children or your mom or 
So you want to give that to someone else. Where are you going to get it from to give to them? You can't give what you don't have. That's the law. So if you want to give unconditional love to someone else, unless you allow yourself to receive it first, then you don't have it to give. You don't have it to give. So putting your oxygen mask on first, as they say in the plane now, before you take off, it's great if you want to help the women and children, but make sure you put your oxygen mask on first, because otherwise you won't be helping anybody for very long. So when I work with people and they tell me, yeah, I'm just here for my children. I'm just here for my husband. I'm like, uh oh, <laughs> <coughs> um, are you here for yourself? Well, of course, but First, my first responsibility is my son. He doesn't have a father and it's, and I'm like, uh oh. So this person hasn't got it yet. They haven't got, if they don't love themselves unconditionally, it's gonna be really hard to teach their child how to love themselves unconditionally because how's it, where's the child gonna see that happening? Any questions about that? So I want to make sure that we're uh, I want to make sure that this communication we're having is a two-way street. Uh, because otherwise I'll feel like, wow, this is just me talking forever. So I'm really interested in anyone who has a goal that um, they're having a challenge with manifesting that they've written down on your sheet. Does anyone have one that they want to share? Yeah, it's okay. Getting money. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. That is a great question. Money. So, do you have all the money you want or need? I'd like $2,000 by the end of the month. <laughs> you need how much by the end 2, of the month? 2000 $2,000. And do you have an idea where you're going to get it from? Open. It's open, like there's a few possibilities. Okay. I take the action and set the intention. It's going from here, then the now, often. That's what I'm just thinking about. Okay, so let's try seeing what happens when you go fishing in your unconscious to see what comes up about money. <laughs> so I used affirmations a lot because I'm a rebirther, because I liked Louise Hay and uh, Sandra Ray, people who, who turned me on to affirmations. And I was surprised when I became a rebirther that uses affirmations a lot, how, why is it that sometimes affirmations work and sometimes they don't? Or sometimes they work for a little while and then they don't. So I didn't read this anywhere. It was through working with people that I saw this. A classic affirmation is I deserve love or money is my friend. Those are classic affirmations. I want you guys to consider that affirmations get in the way sometimes. So when you say, I deserve love, or think it, or write it down, write it on your wrist, put it on the fridge, say it, 
20 times every three hours and think that love is coming. The problem with that is when you say or think, I deserve love, if the automatic echo or feedback in your head that's coming from the 90%, the unconscious, you say, I deserve love, the echo is, if I deserve love, what the fuck happened to my marriage? And why am I so unhappy right now? If money is my friend, how come I don't have enough? I, I, I'm not sure where it's going to, I don't know how I'm going to get it. Okay, when that thought automatically attaches itself to your thinking, when you say, I deserve love, then not only is love not coming, you're guaranteeing it's not going to come when that's attached to it. So every time you, you do the affirmation, you're cementing in that it's not going to happen. So you will notice that the Bible doesn't say, affirm and you shall receive. It says, ask and you will be answered. It says, knock, and the door will open. So when you put why in front of an affirmation, it turns into, why do I deserve love? So we're going to go with you why is money my friend is the implant. So you, I'm going to take you guys through some implants. The implants are, um, you can think of them as going fishing in your pond to see who's biting. There's no right or wrong answers. These things are just automatic. So when you say, the way the, the way the implant works is I say it once out loud, you repeat it once out loud, and I just ask you to notice when you say the implant out loud, I ask you to notice what's the first thing that pops up in your head as a thought or in your heart as a feeling. That's all. So when you say, why is it okay for me to have more money than I need? Why is it okay for me to have more money than I need? Take a breath up in that heart center. Notice what pops up. You don't need to take a half an hour, just what pops up right away. What's the feeling when you say, why is it okay for me to have more money than I need? And where do you feel that the most? I felt around here. Uh huh. Perfect. So I'm going to help you guys get clear. What's the diff? Go ahead. Say it again. So, say that one more time. Why is it okay for me? Why is it okay for me to have more money than I deserve? Is it hard? <gasps> Listen to what this is. So, oh my goodness. Yeah, so there is Who's your the, subconscious yeah. kicking in. Yeah. And so, I want to help you see the difference between a thought and a feeling. Mm -hmm. So when you have someone, or your partner, or when you're listening to yourself and you say, I feel that when you 
say that and then you hear a bunch of words. I feel that blah, blah, blah. Okay, that is not a feeling. A feeling is one word at a time. I feel sad. I feel happy. I feel excited. I feel frustrated. One word. And it usually, a feeling usually has a location in your body. So I feel sad, might be in the heart. I feel frustrated, could be in the belly, could be in the heart, could feel something in the throat. Feelings have bodily locations. If you're looking for where the bodily location is and you, and you can't find it, then probably it's happening between your ears. It's not a feeling, it's a thought. I can't emphasize to you how much it's important to make the distinction when you're communicating with yourself or others or listening to other people to get what is, is this a thought or is this a feeling? Because there are no good or bad feelings. We can say, you know, there's limiting or negative feelings. But I would like you to see that thoughts are different. Thoughts you can have whatever thoughts you want, but they have results, the thoughts. The feelings, though, they are just what they are. They are you giving feedback to yourself when you have a feeling. So if you have a positive feeling, like you're saying, I feel relaxed right now, or I feel excited, or I feel something, I am going to now introduce to you that your feelings and your needs are directly entwined and inseparable. So your feelings are a reflection of your needs. So when you think of your needs, I want to ask you, do you know what your needs are? No. Okay, thank you. Do you know what your needs are? In life, in, for our life. Or yeah. My needs are oxygen, water, no. blood. Okay. Mark, do you know what your needs are? Um, beauty, creativity, freedom. A little louder. So. Freedom. Yeah. Beauty, creativity, love, food, and gravity. You have a need for gravity? <laughs> <laughs> to keep you on the planet? Um, okay. To be happy, safe, and connected. Okay. Okay, perfect. So, this workshop, we're hopefully going to provide you with some self-help tools <laughs> that you can take home and use for the rest of your life <laughs> after this workshop is over. And one of those tools that I want to introduce you to is called Nonviolent Communication, Marshall Rosenberg. And that is a site that you can go to, and there's a whole bunch of free stuff, videos, all kinds of stuff on it about what is nonviolent communication. So, in nonviolent communication, what they help you get clear is there is a list called the universal needs. The universal needs. And I'm going to ask you, if you were to guess, how many, how many items do you think 
is on the universal need list. How many universal needs are there? Five, fifty, three, three, two. Wow. So we got a lot to pick from. Okay, so what I love to tell you about, because um, this really helped me out when I studied nonviolent communication and saw this list that said these are the universal needs. And there was 30 plus items on that list. And it's not set in stone, but it's not infinite either. It doesn't just go on forever. So, yeah, I, I recommend you go and just Google NBC Universal Need List, <laughs> and you will see the universal needs. So what it says is things like, everybody has a need for meaningful communication. Everyone has a need for meaningful activity. Everyone has a need for peace. Everyone has a need for beauty, health, exercise, nutrition, support. There's like 30. And the thing that they are saying is every human being, no matter how old they are, what sex they are, what religion they are, they all have the same needs. It was a major eureka for me to sort of get because I'd had a couple of marriages and things where people are saying, well, you know, Lex, you have your needs, I have mine. <laughs> and it never sounded right to me. <laughs> but when I saw, oh, so there's 30 universal needs that we all have. Also, what goes with the NVC is it's saying those needs are directly connected to your feelings. Now, here's the part I want you to really pay attention to. So, if you make a list of the universal feelings, it's interesting how the list is easier to make. The negative feelings is a bigger list than the positive feelings. Wonder how that happens. Anyway, the connection is when you're having a positive feeling, it's because some need you have just got met. That's why you're having a positive feeling. So if any one of you say to me, I'm really happy right now, and I go, well, you know, what need did you have that just got met? If you just say, oh, I, I don't know, I, I just, I, it was a sunny day, I got, off, I, got a, I got off the right side of the bed today. If you're not sure, I'm saying to you, it's going to help you immensely to understand yourself and all the people in this planet that you're relating to if you see the connection of feelings and needs. Because you'll see that when someone gets a need met, they have a positive feeling. If someone has a need that isn't getting met, they're having a negative feeling. You can't fix that for them, but you can help them and you can help yourself when you're not feeling good to ask yourself the question when you're not feeling good, what need do I have right now that isn't getting met? So if you name the need, so if you're having trouble with money and you ask yourself, what need do I have that isn't getting met? And you look at the universal needs, you may find that um, one of the needs that jumps out is you is, is security. What do you need the money for, this two grand? 
Um, to bring my children over to Bali. Ah, there you go. And There's that's very practical. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. So what I'm saying to you is to get a need met, you can apply a strategy to get a need met. And if that strategy doesn't work, you can try another strategy. And I'm going to suggest to you is there are endless strategies. There are so many different ways that you can try to get a need met. <coughs> when you know what the need is that you're trying to get met. But if you don't connect the need up to the feeling, it's really difficult, really difficult to know which strategy to try. So yeah, strategy and needs. Once I know that what needed is a person's trying to get met, I can provide them with a strategy. I can say, try this, and then they'll give me the feedback. I tried it, it didn't work. Okay, then try this. There's endless strategies to create the needs. But, the, but, but how you get a feeling like you're getting somewhere is you are doing things. But if you just feel stuck, like, like I tried five things, I don't have the money, I don't know where it's going to come from, you're not trying anything then. <laughs> you're just sitting there worried. I loved when someone called this morning and said, I might be stuck here and I promised I'd be on time and I'm worried that I'm not going to make it. And I said, don't worry about it, it won't help anyway. Uh, whatever time you get here is okay. And they were like, yeah, but I promised. So what I want you to notice is when you argue for your limitations, they're yours. So if I was to say to you, I am very confident that you could manifest the money for the ticket for your children, I'm willing I'm willing for you to manifest that faster than you can imagine. I am. The thing is, if you think not, then, yeah. Yeah, if you're the one who's creating the scarcity, you're the one who can create the abundance. This is why I'm just saying, when we get back to anything that happens in your life, you can choose to be at cause or at effect. Always, at cause or at effect. And so if something's happening in your life and you're like, no, I definitely didn't want this to happen, and it's not really my fault, out of my control, then really what you're kind of saying is you're a victim. <laughs> and I am going to suggest to you that you are never a victim other than by choice. If you choose to give up your power to something outside of yourself, then you're stuck until that something outside does something different. I'm going to remind you, you have no control over anything outside of yourself. I'm also going to ask you all to consider if you work really hard on yourself, you may be responsible for your thoughts if you work really hard on yourself. You may be responsible for your feelings, you may be responsible for your needs, for your actions, if you work really hard on yourself. But as far as you being responsible for anyone else's feelings or needs, forget it. It's not possible. So we're going all the way back to who's responsible for our feelings. 
we are. So if you're having a feeling that isn't okay, what does that mean? You need to do something different. <laughs> if you want to change it, you're responsible for it. So if you're having a feeling that isn't okay, it means you need to do something different. And in a way, it's not even so important which one you start with, or, but it's that you start doing something different. I'm going to suggest to you that whenever you ask questions, you get answers. That's the law. That's inquiry. You ask a question, you get more information. What a belief is, a belief means you're not asking the questions anymore. So if I believe that I, I, I believe I'm a Jehovah Witness, if I'm a Jehovah Witness, I believe I'm going to heaven. And if you're not, I believe you're going to hell. That's what I believe. And I don't care what you think about it. It's not even open for discussion. So the physicists that I talk to, they're saying, the moment that you stop asking questions is the end of your evolution. As soon as you stop asking questions, there's no more evolution. There's no evolving. You evolve from inquiry. And this is why implants begin with why. So when you start doing some implants like, why is money my friend? Why is there more than enough to go around? Why is there always more where that came from? Produces results. But if you focus on, yeah, but I tried this and it didn't work. As soon as you say that, you're supporting it not working. So if you even spent three minutes in this break that's coming up and lay back and said to yourself, I'm going to just try this experiment. I'm going to lay down, come out of my thinking and go into creating my next thought. And I'm going to, in my mind, see that I manifested the two grand in my mind. And I'm going to see me buying the tickets or, you know, seeing it in the bank account. And I'm going to just for a couple of minutes allow myself to feel how I'd feel. So you go there, you feel the feeling. I got the money. Oh man, awesome. Um, yeah, try it at the break. Try it for three minutes. Because I'm suggesting to you that putting your energy into that is going to surprise you. I was hitchhiking with my son. We weren't getting a ride. This was many years ago. And I was like, okay, something's stuck here. And he's like, Dad, there's hardly any cars. <laughs> he said all these things. I said, Bud, do me a favor. I want you to just act like the ride is coming now. I want you to see us getting into a car. So I was doing the visualization thing. And then I added, I want you to feel, let yourself feel like we got the ride. And you know, he's like, okay. So we've been there 20 minutes. In three minutes, a car appeared and pulled over. He's like, shit. That's amazing. So 
we're going to take a break in a minute, but I want to leave you with one last um, example of how fast things happen sometimes when you just change the thinking. Because remember, I'm suggesting to you that our thinking creates almost everything that thinking does. The thoughts that you are either choosing, which is way easier, or the thoughts that are just keep coming in. You're like, oh yeah, I have this thought a lot. Oh yeah, this. It's like. So I was in Vancouver in the 90s, and I was reading a newspaper, and it said, when you see a penny on the ground, are you the kind of person who picks it up or do you leave it? <laughs> so I'm reading, you know, the newspaper and I'm like, yeah, well, I, I'm, I'm the kind of person that actually leaves it because I think someone else deserves it more than me, a penny. I, I'd rather someone who needs it take it. Then it went on to say, if you're a person who doesn't pick it up, that's a big mistake. <laughs> I was like, really? And it said, yeah, it said, when you see a penny on the ground, the universe is trying to give you something. You always need to pick it up. Because if you don't, you're telling the universe you're not willing to receive. And I, I read this and I thought, well, that's weird, that's sort of interesting. And then I thought, well, you know, maybe the next time I see a penny, I'll, I'll try that just for fun. Because I'm always willing to try anything, check anything out. I, I like asking, I like inquiry, I like learning. And I know from learning, I, how I get learning is I ask questions. So two nights later, I'm at a bar great music. On the way home, I go to a pizza place to get a slice of pizza. I'm standing in line and <clears throat> not much happening there. Um, there's a guy in front of me and a guy behind. <laughs> and, you know, I just gaze down and there's a penny on the floor. And as soon as I saw the penny, I was like, Relax, remember what you said the next time you see a penny? You know what you said. And I'm like, yeah, I said I was going to pick it up. And so I look behind me. The guy behind me is sort of gazing over there. And the guy in front of me doesn't. And I'm thinking, OK, I'm going for it. So I reached down, grabbed a penny, and I put it in my pocket. And I thought, that wasn't so hard. And all of a sudden, I feel this tap on my shoulder. And I turn around, <laughs> and the guy behind me, he doesn't say anything. He just has this really knowing look. And he grabs my hand, and he puts something in it. And he doesn't say anything. And so I feel what he put in my hand, and I open my hand. And there is a Canadian loony. So a loony is a coin that's worth a dollar, and, and it's a gold color. <laughs> and so I got the loony in my hand, and I'm like, and I put it in my pocket, and I thought, fuck, that works fast. <laughs> I always pick up any currency here, even if it's one. <laughs> one of the smallest coins that you can hardly buy anything with. Even if I just give it to someone else, but always pick it up. The universe is always trying to give to you. It's never trying to give you a hard time. It's, it's never uh, angry. It's always trying to help you, always. That's something that we will get back to after the break of do you experience that? That the universe is always trying to help you? Always there for money, for support, for love? 